Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are going to have Lisa Richardson, Director of CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, answer some questions to help you understand the vaccine and how to stay safe right now. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Please introduce yourself. Hey, good morning, Mike. Um, I'm Lisa Richardson. I'm the Division Director of Cancer Prevention and Control at CDC. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions um, today. Thank you. Thanks so much. So because of the pandemic, colorectal cancer screening rates have dropped. What advice do you have for those wanting to stay safe but are also due for a colorectal cancer screening? So what we want people to realize is not to put off their well person care, which is what colon cancer screening is. And so what we recommend is that you stay on schedule as much as possible um, and mainly talk with your provider about what safety precautions they put in place. Almost all providers are using the CDC guidelines for staying safe in the clinic. Um, and so that would be my best advice, but don't uh, put off getting your care because it could be um, critical moving forward if you're found to have cancer that's um, spread or um, a higher stage. And what are some of those precautions that will be recommended that cancer patients take as they are going to be engaging back with their providers? So what we recommend at CDC is that um, wherever you go in your clinic that they have um, barriers set up. You've been to the places with the plexiglass, um, making sure that in the waiting room seats are not, you know, side by side, at least six feet apart. The things that we recommend for everyone and everyone should be wearing a mask um, and washing their hands. And for those out there who are currently in treatment, you know, and as we're looking forward to the different mm -hmm. vaccines and things that will become available, will there be any side effects or any other adverse interactions between the vaccine and chemo or other cancer treatments? Well, since we can't say for sure because cancer patients on chemotherapy weren't in the clinical trials, but what I would say is if, if you're done with treatment, that you definitely should get the vaccine. Um, for those who are currently being treated, we are working on recommendations to try to figure out what those might be and how they may go. But the vaccine is very new. What's it been now? About six weeks since we started vaccinating people. Uh, we have heard of some, a few severe side effects, but when you do the math, it's about one in a million, probably what we would expect with other vaccines as well. Sure. And with it being so new, is there any right. updates on when cancer patients should expect to be able to receive the vaccine themselves? I think what we're trying to work out right now are who are the high risk groups other than, so the ones in particular, which is good, are healthcare providers who take care of patients. So we don't want them transmitting the virus to people coming in for care. And then those in nursing homes are over 65 um, years old. I would say since colon cancer is an, a um, cancer of older people, um, just on age, most, you know, most people would qualify. Some states are doing 60, some states are doing 65 um, right now. I would say the biggest challenge for the public is that each state is setting its own recommendations. So wherever you live, I would recommend that you go to your state health department website for um, health information on the vaccine, because once we send the vaccine out, um, from the two companies, each state determines how they're going to um, classify and stratify patients to get the vaccine or the public, I should say they're not patients. Fantastic. And then for, uh, for other concerns, will there be anything that you know of post vaccination? So once that is available, once cancer patients are able right. to get the vaccine, are there any further complications you could imagine post vaccine? Well, I'd say the, the, the one clue, since we, this is very new, the one clue that usually we recommend is a live vaccine. We don't recommend that cancer patients get those. One of the flu vaccines is a live virus, um, but these are not. These are just um, messenger RNA-based um, vaccines at the moment, and they should, be, they should not cause any problems with um, making people sick. We have not seen that in the clinical trials. So no, I think people would be fine. It's the usual, what you get after you know, a vaccine, maybe some swelling in the arm, some pain, those types of things, maybe a low grade fever, but nothing um, too severe. The one thing we have seen that we're recommending that if you've ever had an allergic reaction to a vaccine that you not get it because your risk may be higher, we're not sure, but um, if you've had a vaccine and had an allergic reaction, you shouldn't, well, you shouldn't really be getting any other vaccines either mm -hmm. as a general okay. rule, yeah. 
And then right now, what's it like out there for frontline health workers who are currently receiving the vaccine? And especially in relation to why is it important for us to keep our individual health and safety in order to support them? Well, I think for us to be as mindful of them is that one of the frustrating things you've heard, I'm sure, and that I've heard is that um, healthcare workers are very discouraged by the fact that people don't believe that the COVID-19 virus is a, is a thing, right? And so they're the people who are with the patient at the bedside, usually by themselves because family is not allowed to come in. And it's very, um, kills your mora the morale of wherever you're working, as well as keeping yourself um, you know, psyched up to do the work. The biggest thing I would say is that healthcare workers are just exhausted right now um, because the numbers are going up and we need to be mindful of keeping them safe, ourselves safe, our family and everyone else. And so again, those three things we tell people to do is to wear a mask, you know, stay out of crowds and six feet apart when you can. Yeah, and certainly speaking of the some of the misinformation out there that you that you just described, yeah. what kind of resources or what is the CDC able to do to help debunk a lot of that misinformation that's swirling around? I think we I can't remember. I should have looked this up. We could look it up later, but I think we even have a, a website called debunking myths or something similar to that. Like what you should know and what you know what is true, what isn't true. So I'd say come to the CDC website, um, the coronavirus site. Um, you could probably just search that. But just um, one thing I would say is be careful of the source of the information that you're choosing to um, consume as well. So use trusted sources like CDC, the American Cancer Society, you guys that fight colorectal cancer um, and others. And that brings up an interesting question. What do we need to know about some of the COVID-19 variants that are popping up in the news? Um, what I would say about knowing about variants is that um, the two that we've that I know the most about the one from the UK and there's another one is that they seem to be more infectious, but they don't seem to uh, make people sicker so it's spread it's easier it's more easily spread, but it doesn't make you sicker when you get it so that's what's the concern that we had is that it would be one that would make people sicker. But having said that, the issue here is overwhelming the healthcare system because there's so many more infections and so many more people who may end up in the hospital um, and who may not you know, make it through the, the infection. And that's just the numbers game. It's not that it's more deadly, it's just there are more people getting the virus. Does that make and sense? The current, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And will the current vaccines also protect against the variants or will they be will they need a new series of vaccines? So what I've heard, I'm not a vaccine expert, and there's probably some of this information on, on the coronavirus website at CDC as well, if you want to go there and look uh, to share with the people who are watching this. Um, but yes, it looks like the main components of the vaccine are still effective and that the vaccine will protect against those variants. That's what we know at this moment. So check again in a month. I may have a different answer. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> I think it's, it's moving at the speed of science, as they say, you know. <laughs> I mean, think about it. A vaccine in 10 months? That's unheard of. Unheard of. of. Unheard yeah. of. I think the fastest one Absolutely. they said before was four years. So um, we came from a four-year window to 10 months. Right. When you have the, the resources, the motivation, and the, yeah. the talent, really, too. Yeah. You, know, you have a lot of that combined there. And so despite all that talent, we're still seeing a lot of decline rates rising. Right. So what is the impact of that? And what, what can you expect for future trending with that? You mean for the cancers or screening? Um, for for the decline for the vaccine, people declining to receive the vaccine. Oh, oh, you mean the people that don't feel good about taking it? Well, I think, well, I will say, okay, this for, the vaccine has become a political statement, right? So I appreciate your question before about what should we tell people about getting the vaccine. Um, COVID-19 is not blue or red, <laughs> and we're all susceptible to getting it. And, you know, it really is about protecting your health um, and to, so that you can live longer and healthier, right, as a person. And so I still say there are a lot of rumors out there. What I said earlier, you know, there's a site on, at CDC where we go through, you know, what's true and what isn't true. And I would highly recommend that people go there. But the vaccine really is about protecting others and, and you know, secondarily yourself. So if you care about others, family members, whoever, you know, really is the thing to do. Excellent. 
Thank you so much for being able to answer some of those questions about myths, because that's certainly something that we <laughs> yeah. uh, we hear a lot about. And we want to make sure that we have the right resources and right guidance for people, because there is so much misinformation out there and because there right. is so much challenge with that. So what future resources aside from just myth busting is the CDC created to help provide advice and other guidance to cancer patients at this time? So what we're doing at uh, in cancer prevention and control is we're getting ready to roll out a uh, communication initiative around staying safe um, during COVID while you're out getting your screening, trying to get people back into screening. So we're doing that with the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Centers Network. We hope to have that ready in the next two to three weeks, but it's a set of videos that just describes pretty much the tagline is cancer doesn't wait and neither should you. And so really going through the things I just talked about, you know, if, if you're due for screening, you know, check with your provider, see what procedures they have in place to keep you safe. And remember that, you know, your care is important during this time as well. So that should be next couple of weeks, I hope. And then uh, we're doing a satellite media tour with um, TV stations and radio stations uh, end of January to really push the word out um, about, you know, take care of yourself. We all forget there are lots of people out there now dying of heart attacks, strokes, other conditions that are totally treatable because they're terrified of going to the hospital. And I think right now you may not be able to get into a hospital because it's so crowded, but I think if you're having an emergency, you will be seen and um, you, sh you should definitely not put things off if you're sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then so for, for those out there who maybe even with the encouragement and everything are still just feeling maybe perhaps some anxiety about going yeah. out, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. For things like screening, you know, what is your opinion on making the choice to get a fit test or Cologuard or other less invasive screening methodology instead of going in for a colonoscopy at this point? Yeah, you guys have probably heard this. <laughs> Any, the best test is the one that gets done, right? But I would add the best test is the one that gets done right, okay? So if you, have, if you do a fit test and it's positive, you have to have access to colonoscopy because that might be your final common pathway to getting your abnormal test resolved, right? So um, just be mindful of that. But yeah, that is one way to go. You know, there's an at-home cervical cancer screening test as well. Not approved, you know, it's not recommended by the um, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force yet, but that is one way to go. But I think if you're gonna do that or if providers are going to recommend that, we still have to be sure that you have access to a colonoscopy and that you're willing to do it after you have a positive fit because that is the thing to do next, right? You get the fit, you feel good about it, it's abnormal, you're still terrified about the colonoscopy, you really have to think about the downstream consequences as well. Mm, mm, mm. Indeed. Yeah. So is there, is there any other advice that you have for our colorectal cancer patient advocate and ambassador population here listening today? Well, what I'd say is, you know, keep in mind that COVID-19 is going to go away and we still need to keep in mind that people have to need to be screened for colorectal cancer. Lots of people haven't been, um, but my last word would be COVID. It's like um, COVID is like government. <laughs> All things are local, right? And so to pay attention to what goes on in your local community, what the COVID rates are there, what your local providers are up against. We have a resource at CDC, the COVID tracker. I think I sent it to um, Angie at least, and she may have shared it with you all, but you can see what your county level COVID prevalence is um, in the last seven days so that you can actually make some informed choices about what you wanna do with your health. All right. And bottom line, Dr. Richardson, should colorectal cancer patients get the vaccine when it becomes available to them? Bottom line, when it's available, they should get it. Yes. Unless they have some other contraindication that's on the list. As I said, allergic reactions, those types of things. But um, it's like all vaccines. I'll share with you when the um, when the, uh, the chickenpox vaccine, not chickenpox, HPV vaccine became available <laughs> for, for girls. So when they started talking about it might be good for boys, I was, you know, we were in line even before it was recommended for boys because, you know, vaccines are like the most important and most effective things we do in medicine. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all out there for listening. And I'm sure we'll be hosting you again sometime soon for a lot more great information. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it.